Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center. Welcome to Knife AQ number 65, the knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week, a bunch of good questions, but one of the big things we're going to focus on is blade shapes. What are they? What are they good for? This, that, and the other thing. Let's get into it. All right, everyone, thank you as always for your questions. Uh, if you want a chance to have one of your questions featured in a future Knife AQ, just leave it in the comments section below. That's where we see them and where we kind of pull things together when we're building out these episodes. Uh, this week, jumping right in to the main topic at hand. Jeremy Fox asks us, Hello, David. I've got a question. Might be a bit dull to some, but can you explain the difference between clip point and drop point? Every time I think I know which is which, I get it wrong. Also, Warncliffe and Sheep's Foot. Thanks for your time. Love the videos. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, not, not a dull question because as we're going to find out here, something that you might think is like completely straightforward isn't always the case. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go beyond. We've never really covered all the basic blade shapes in one video before. So I'm going to answer the parts of your question in particular, but also I'm going to cover a wide range of blade shapes, at least a good basic primer. You're going to have uh, you know, a good set of vocabulary and a, a good knowledge of what constitutes what or the best that I can, can give you guys anyway. Uh, but we'll start with the clip points and the drop points blades. Two of the most common shapes you see in, in most EDC uh, everyday carry folding knives out there. They're just super useful. They're versatile, uh, can be used, can be made to work for anything from just general utility stuff to tactical stuff. Of course, like food prep and uh, hunting, skinning, camping, just an overall very versatile shape. I will start with the drop point. This is a ZT562CF with a drop point blade shape. And drop point comes from, you know, you've got a tip, you've got your point, but the drop comes in from the spine. Uh, ignore the, the thumb ramp bit here, that's not necessary for a drop point, but all you do with a drop point is you have that gentle curvature, sometimes gentle, sometimes more abrupt, but it's a, a moreover gentle curve towards the tip. And that's your drop point blade. Usually it's a shape kind of like this where you have some straight edge or when you're talking about the edge side, you've got a little bit of straight edge and you've got this section of belly out in here near the front. That's the curved section. Sometimes the whole edge can be a little curved. There's, there's wiggle room in there, but the dropping spine, the gently arcing down spine is what constitutes the drop point in general. Clip point one of the most iconic folders ever made, the Buck 110. Got, gets its name from the tip right here that is clipped out. It's got this uh, concave curvature towards the tip here rather than a gentle curve down, uh, which would be a convex curve uh, in this case. Advantage of these, you can often get a much more acute tip uh, as such as a lot of, uh, especially older school hunting knives uh, had clip points like this. I think after uh, Bob Loveless introduced his drop point hunter or popularized it, you see a lot more drop points in the, uh, the hunting sphere, but still a very versatile shape uh, just with that little bit of difference. You can get a typically more needle like point, although not exclusively. There are gray areas where it works either way. Uh, now let's get into some kind of variation, variations or variants on these two. I've got another Buck 110 right here. This is the Slim Pro. Also has a clip point, but it doesn't have that concave scoop or that half moon, you know, shape to the clip. It is instead a straight line from where you don't have a gentle curve, but from where the spine starts to angle towards the tip, towards the tip, one straight line, and we call this a straight clip or a straight clip point. Still a clip point, but yeah, definitely different from that classic, you know, half moon clip out. So hope that helps there. Uh, this next knife, this is a Boker LRF demonstrates a spear point profile, which meets all the definitions of a drop point. And in fact it is, but spear points, the tip of these, of the uh, blade itself sits on the center line. It's not above or below that line. And typically 
the spine and the edge itself follow the same or very similar arcs. You know, you can almost reverse the uh, or mirror the image top to bottom. That's not strictly necessary. That's just more of a generalization there. But drop points with more or less equal blades that has a tip in the center line, we call it a spear point. Um, so those are a couple variants. Now let's get into some modifiers. Uh, and this is where, you know, Thomas might throw up his, uh, his getting in the weeds graphic. But let's be honest, this whole question is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but it's important stuff. Uh, this next knife here, CRKT PSD, which stands for particle separation device, which I think is a fantastic name for a knife. A lot of different things going on here. You've got or typically this blade, we would call it a harpoon point. And all that means is you've got this kind of scoop out of the spine back here that scoops or that uh, angles back up towards the spine area and then comes down towards the tip. Now this can be most often you see it like this with a straight line there. So this is technically a straight clip point, but it's a harpooned or a harpoon straight clip point in this case, but that section here could be dropped. You could have it on other blade shapes as well. It doesn't have to be on a, a clip or drop point shape. You could get it on, you know, sheep's foot and worn cliffs too, technically. You've also got a recurve to the heel of the edge right here. So this is a recurved harpoon straight clip point blade shape. Weeds are getting tall, aren't Weeds. they? <laughs> Again, th those are just kind of modifiers that you could apply towards just about any kind of blade shape out there. Most commonly, you see it with a with a shape like this straight clip point profile, technically, but there you go. Uh, now let's get into the sheep's foot and Warncliffe side of things. And interestingly, when we talk about blade shapes, usually the kind of the defining feature of any style of blade shape is the way the spine is or, or the, the kind of shape the spine makes. Sheep's foot and Warncliffe's are one of the only ones um, that that are out there that actually prescribe a very specific edge profile in that the edge on a on a unmodified style of sheep's foot or Warncliffe should be completely straight. Uh, I've got a CRKT spew up here on top and an Ontario Bezra flipper on the bottom. Warncliffe with the spew, sheep's foot with the Bezra. And the main difference uh, here is a Warncliffe will typically have a much longer drop from the spine so that you get an almost needle like tip. It's designed to have that very precise, very sharp piercing point. Whereas the sheep's foot blade is not going to have that long gentle arc down towards the needle like tip it tends to have a more abrupt shape towards the tip, more of an abrupt drop. And that's because more of like the intended uses. This is not intended primarily to be a thinner, uh, pokier, pointier, daintier blade style. It's got a little more strength out there towards the tip at the expense of the piercing efficiency. Great utility shapes right here. Uh, you know, good for EDC, especially if you don't need anything where you might need the belly of a drop point or a clip point. These things work great. Uh, anything where both of these styles actually, uh, the Warncliffe and the Sheep's Foot work really well when you're working on a surface and using the tip of the knife. Great for drawing across, you know, a cutting board or a craft mat or cutting any kind of thing on a surface, whether it could be the ground on a construction project for that matter. Now the style you see here on this Bezra has sort of a, an abrupt change to the angle. It can be a little more gentle. It doesn't have to be this abrupt or, or this kind of sharp of a turn when it does it. All of them are good old sheep's foot blades. Now, where's the line between Warncliffe and sheep's foot? Hard to define, honestly, there, and there's no, there, there's no right answer in this case. Consequently, there's no wrong answer. I take that back. There's some, there's certain times we can definitely say something is wrong, but to demonstrate what I mean, this knife right here, the, uh, I almost called it an Ontario, the Giant Mouse Ace Riv. What's the blade shape? We've got a more gentle, uh, or, or, or it's not quite a Warncliffe, I don't think. It's, it doesn't have that long needle-like tip, but it does have a longer drop to the spine than, you know, something like that Bezra. Uh, but this is also what we would call 
So we'll, we'll go with sheep's foot um, rather than Warncliffe. And basically that's because you don't really have the needle-like tip. This would be a modified sheep's foot because you have curvature to the edge itself. But it's almost getting into drop point territory in a way. Hence the, uh, hence the weeds, hence the no right or wrong answer in this case. But I'd go, definitely go with modified sheep's foot in this case. A uh, famous case or a uh, famous example of a modified Warncliffe would be something like the Kershaw Leak. You've got that curvature towards the edge, but you still have a needle-like tip in this case. And when we get into that word modified inside, uh, you know, inside baseball, behind the scenes stuff here, when we say something's a modified blade shape, it's because it doesn't quite fit exactly, but it still feels like a certain thing. We call it modified. There you go. Um, next up, uh, cleavers. Let's get into those. This is the Kershaw bracket right here. And this is also kind of a gray area when we get into cleavers. Some of them are very kind of cleaver-esque and make you think of a meat cleaver. This one certainly does, but it's also kind of a modified sheep's foot. There's a line, it's just in the weeds. <laughs> it's in the weeds there somewhere. Uh, cool knives and that, that the, common, the reason I call this a modified sheep's foot in a way, in addition to a cleaver, is when I like to describe knives to folks, I, I try to describe the blade and how it's going to work, how it's going to feel when you're using it. And as such, some of these different blade shapes can inform that description. Uh, if I say this is more of a, like a modified sheep's foot style of cleaver, it's going to give you an idea of how it performs. Uh, if it's a more of a choppier cleaver, I probably wouldn't call it a modified sheep's foot blade in that case. Gray areas, weeds, weeds are growing fast. All right, a few more blade shapes I want to talk about. We, you know, we talked about the bulk of your question, um, but another important shape is the trailing point. Uh, I've seen here on this CRKT Gobi, and all that means is the tip of the blade sits above the line of the spine of the knife. It is trailing away. Uh, has several different names, that's probably the most correct here, but you'll hear stuff like this referred to as like a Persian blade style sometimes, or just an upswept blade. Uh, upswept certainly works. Sometimes though, you can have an actual upswept blade where the tip is not above the line of the spine there. So it's technically not a trailing point in that case. Now a trailing point is typically great at slicing tasks. Uh, you see it a lot on hunting knives, for example, and a lot of uh, food prep and butchery style of knives as well, like the scimitars and, or scimeters or however they pronounce it for the, the kitchen side of things, um, all do this kind of thing. Even a butcher knife, uh, technically, depending on how the, uh, the clip is shaped or how the tip is shaped, can be a trailing point blade, although not always. I'm not gonna get into some of those uh, different shapes in this particular video. Just keep in mind that those are out there as well. Uh, but even day-to-day -day uses, slicing stuff, if you're, if you're looking for that long, efficient slice, especially on like pull cuts like this, this type of blade shape is going to work really well. Now, tantos, or tantos, or however, however you pronounce it. Um, might be, this might be the most divisive part of this whole section of the question here. Uh, we're gonna start with, I say this because there's actually two different um, equally correct at this point in time anyway, versions of what a Tonto can be. And I'll start with this Cold Steel Recon Tonto right here. Um, this is what we refer to as either an American style Tonto or a Western style Tonto. And no one out there more than Cold Steel is responsible for really popularizing this blade shape. And similarly actually to the, uh, a true Warncliffe and a true uh, Sheep's Foot, a Tonto or an American Tonto does not describe the way the spine works. You can have a trailing point like you have on this knife. You can also have drop point Tontos at, <laughs> at this place, uh, depending on how the spine arcs down. But the key feature for a Western style Tonto is this tip section right here. You're gonna have a very abrupt change in the angle of the edge right here. In fact, coming to a point in most typical cases, so that you've got a leading edge that could be used for some chisel -y stuff. Typically, they're very straight here at the leading edge, although that's not exclusively the case always. There is just a hint of curvature here. You also typically, again, not exclusively, but 
quite often see compound grinds. You've got hollow ground section here on the main edge, and this leading edge has a flat grind. And this style of Tonto with, on this blade in particular is gonna give you a very strong tip for piercing. It's not going to be an efficient piercer necessarily, but is it going to be very strong for rough handling in those kinds of uses. Now, the traditional Tonto blade shape is a little bit different. And here we get into uh, you know, what the Tonto was originally in Japan was actually a short sword. And the closest thing, it's, it's actually hard to find a lot of uh, versions on a production knife nowadays that we can really point to. But one of the closest is some of these designs here. This is the Burnley Quaken Compact uh, from Boker. And the Quaken or Kaiken uh, in the original Japanese is more of a smaller knife as opposed to a short sword. And you're gonna get almost just a, a bellied shape. You could have a little more uh, towards the tip here in terms of a, a flatter shape, but you're not really gonna see that you know, defining point where the angle changes at the edge of the blade. It's gonna be a little more gentle. Not necessarily always as gentle as you see here where it's essentially just a big continuous curve, but there you go. So you can see like these are both, you know, different extremes of the same coin. These are both Tonto blades, I declare. Now, we get into Thomas's favorite blade shape over there. And that's because this is one of the hardest to define blade shapes out there, I think. Um, it is the reverse Tonto. Kind of most famous, I think, for being seen on the 940 Osborne series from Benchmade or the newer, what are these, are 945, right, for the mini size, but it's the same kind of blade shape. And that's essentially because if you turn it upside down, you've got that Western Tonto profile here, but the other side of the edge is sharpened. But here we get into gray areas too. Obviously this is very well you know, recognized and kind of agreed upon as a reverse Tonto, but couldn't we kind of call that a clip point with the straight clip point blade there? Check in the weeds. Check in the weeds. And one more, just to make things even extra confusing, Spyderco. They present problems. <laughs> I, I love Spyderco. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, but their blade shapes almost kind of defy definition in some cases. Case in point, this Delica. Cool Santa Fe Stoneworks uh, customized version, by the way. You've got a straight spine, but it's not a clip point. I wouldn't, would never call this a straight clip. You've got a hint of drop here, right at the, uh, towards the tip. Wouldn't call it a drop point either. Wouldn't call it a sheep's foot either. Wouldn't really call it a Warncliffe either, but I think honestly, modified Warncliffe kind of clo most closely describes the way this knife is going to behave when you're cutting things. So I kind of tend to call the Delica a modified Warncliffe. Uh, while also fully acknowledging that it is a very, very imperfect definition. You guys let me know what you think the blade shape on this guy is down below. I vote for Spidey Cliff. Spidey Cliff? I don't even know what that means. That's okay. <laughs> but anyway, that's why, um, well, first of all, I hope this kind of helps give at least a primer on blade shapes. There's certainly a lot more than just these, but these are kind of going to describe the most commonly seen things. And it also kind of help you, uh, you know, understand when I'm talking about a blade and I say it's like a modified this or that, uh, it's because they're, you know, it might not meet the exact definitions of this sort of thing, but it's going to help you, you know, help me describe kind of what it feels like, both in terms of its looks and in terms of how it's going to be used. Uh, and this will also give you, um, there's some weird blade shapes out there that seem to blend like that spider cone away blend a lot of different things together and almost defy explanation. Uh, sometimes I've seen sheep's foot blades, but instead of the drop here, it's like a half moon clip point uh, is taken out of the front. So is that a sheep's clip? Kind of, can tend to kind of mix things together a little bit uh, where necessary, but if you've got the vocabulary, it starts to make sense a little bit. Man, that's a lot of knives for the first question. So I really hope that helps. <laughs> All right, let's get to question number two, shall we? Uh, which comes from Frank William Abagnale. 
Uh, hey David, I'm currently in search of a five to seven inch full tang fixed blade Tonto and I'm not sure which one of the Cold Steel Leatherneck Tonto in D2 or the Cold Steel Recon Tonto in SK5 is the better choice, given that amongst other camping tasks, I'll do some batoning with it. Would love to hear your opinion and if you've got a better alternative about the same price point in mind. Yes. All right, cool. Uh, got a couple things uh, to look at here. Um, first off, I have uh, one of the stainless versions of the Recon Tonto here, but it's the same blade shape. And I've got the Leatherneck Tonto here as well. Uh, Leatherneck Tonto is about 68 bucks. Recon Tonto in SK5 is, I think, like 50 or 60 bucks. Um, I got a tab open over here. Let me check. Look at that. I have the stainless one bookmarked. No matter. Um, between these two, if you're talking about the difference in steel, uh, the D2 versus the SK5, uh, the SK5 being a carbon steel, in this case, is going to be the tougher steel. And I would go for that due to the toughness for that kind of task. And I would also go with that versus the Recon Tonto for the design as well. Primarily because if you're you know, using this in a sort of outdoorsy scenario, which I'll get to more of that in a bit, the guard here on the Leatherneck is more of a combat type of feature. And that's uh, the finger guard, uh, the index finger side, I think is okay. But the part on the spine here is gonna get in the way if you're doing certain tasks where you wanna choke up on the blade or do different ki kinds of grips. Gonna be a little bit much uh, to go there. So for that reason, between the two, like I said, I'd go with the Recon. You can choke up on it a lot better. You can get right behind the edge, do some detail work. However, both of these knives feature a hollow grind. And we didn't talk about grinds at all when we talked about blade shapes. That's, a, that's another video. Um, different weeds. Different weeds. And even though the steel is going to be tougher on the SK5 uh, steel version of the Recon, because the, the grinds here are kind of scooped out to make a very thin edge, you've got a very thin edge, which can be a bit more delicate, especially if you're doing something as abusive as batoning, which that's fine. You know, I have batoned plenty of knives out there. Some companies, you know, you're going to void your warranty if you admit to doing something like that. But be that as it may, I wouldn't really want a hollow ground knife for that type of task. Personally, I wouldn't really go for a Tonto for a, uh, a outdoor camping task, but I'm not going to tell you not to. Obviously, you, that's what you want. You may have some good like chisely type uses in camp for a blade shape like this. So what I'm going to suggest rather than one of those two is... Um, both of these are like at the seven inch at the top end of the range of, uh, of lengths you were talking about. Uh, K bar has actually, this is not what I would suggest. They've got a five and a half inch Tonto with, with a plain edge without serrations. This is flat ground. So it's going to be a little bit tougher, but again, like hold these two up next to each other. You're not going to be, it, it feels like a different beast. So I didn't want to suggest that particular guy. What I'd go with, you can actually save a little bit of money and go with the Spec Plus Alpha Machete from Ontario. 35 bucks for these guys. And you've got 1075 carbon steel, should be very similar in its kind of toughness characteristics to something like the SK5. It's gonna be in a similar range at least. It's not a Tonto, but you do have that sharpened leading edge. So you can do some chisely stuff if that's what you're, uh, you're, you're wanting a Tonto for you'll be able to baton a bit better because you've got a flat grind in this case. So you don't have as thin an edge. There's more strength behind the edge. It's less fragile overall. And for that task, I think this is just going to be better. I mean, this has got splitter all over it. Um, how, do the, how does the rest of it compare to some of these other knives? Um, fit and finish on the cold steels is going to be better, I will admit. Uh, and actually, they're going to be I think a little more comfortable in the hand as well. Not that this is bad, just I think the, the Recon especially fits my hand a little bit better, but this certainly works really well. Uh, both of these, or all of these knives have full length tangs or thereabouts essentially with over molded uh, grips over top. So you still have that kind of shock absorption and cold protection on that. Uh, other differences, the sheath, it's also not as nice on this. It's just kind of a simple nylon pouch. It's very effective, but definitely not as nice as the Securex sheath you would get with the cold steel. But even though these are nicer, I think this Ontario is actually going to be the better tool for the job. 
All right, next question comes from Nam, Nam, Name Brand Flakes. Uh, I think I've decided mostly on Old Hickory for most of my kitchen knives, uh, but I'm looking for some good stainless steak knives and maybe some more budget-friendly Japanese kitchen knives as well. Sure, got some suggestions here for you. Uh, for the steak knife, got an Ontario here that I actually really like, especially when paired with uh, a bunch of other Old Hickory stuff. These are the Robeson Viking steak knives. A set of four of these is about 135 bucks. So it's not a, like a cheap set of steak knives. These are built really well and are gonna look really good with the, you know, a bunch of other wood handled knives. Uh, blade steel here, Sandvix 14C28N with a serrated edge. So you've got that stainless steel. Uh, you've got just a, a pretty good blade material overall and shape that's gonna work really well as your steak knives. Um, don't think these are available individually. Um, it's a set of four, like I said, 135 bucks, made in the USA, which is pretty cool too. Don't see a lot of kitchen knives that are made in the USA. Old Hickory is being a uh, notable exception with their carbon steel blades. Uh, as for a kind of budget uh, Japanese style of knife, um, this brand is, uh, you, you wouldn't expect it from this brand, which is Duecini, which is actually an Italian brand, but this knife right here, they've got a whole series of Japanese made, traditional patterned Japanese style kitchen knives. This is the six inch Diba, comes in about 38 bucks. So not quite as affordable as an old Hickory is, which is kind of miraculous how inexpensive those knives are, but still a very, very attainable knife. And you've got more patterns than this obviously, but definitely worth checking out. Uh, the handles here are maple. It's not a stabilized wood or anything at this price point, but then again, neither are your old hickories. It's got a just a traditional oval-shaped pattern. You're not gonna get any of like the D-shaped handles you would get on something higher end like a Shun, but they feel built really well. Uh, you know, 420 series steel, nothing exotic, but the reason I picked this over some other things like, uh, I mean, there's other good Japanese-made kitchen knives uh, that are inexpensive that we sell, but very few of them have traditional grinds. In this case, we've actually got a chisel grind on this knife where it's ground from one side only and the back side has no primary bevel behind the edge. So going to work for have, have a very traditional feel. And they feel pretty solid and look pretty solid too. All right, that was a lot of weeds today. So let's get into the lightning round uh, and speed things up here a little bit. Uh, uh, Graham Blackall asks, hi sir, greetings from the UK. Uh, I'm considering getting a knife blade laser engraved for my new grandson. Uh, congratulations, by the way. Uh, my questions are, can laser engraving affect the heat treatment of a blade and are some steels better than others to avoid this? Thanks, take care, Graham. Um, I wouldn't worry about it, quite honestly. Um, any kind of lasering that's gonna happen is happening a little further up on the blade for one thing but it's not gonna cause enough heat buildup to really alter the temper of any of the blades. Only piece of advice I'll give you, you know, don't worry about what steel you're looking for, um, but keep an eye on the coatings or the finish on the blade. A mirror polished blade, very hard to laser engrave because guess what? It reflects the lasering uh, back off of the surface on really high polish stuff. The Kershaw Leak here, great choice. The bead blasted nature of these blades tend to laser engrave very well. Uh, in terms of stuff with like harder coatings like DLC, PVD, stuff like that, I'm not sure how well that does or doesn't engrave. I feel like I've seen engraved PVD stuff before. Um, but DLC might be a, might be a little tricky. Um, but stuff like the, stuff like a bead blast fin bleed blasted finish tends to work really well. Actually, something like a black stone wash finish like you see on this Bezra might work really well too, because then you're gonna get a lot of, of good contrast as well, which could be pretty neat. And in fact, I've, I've not laser engraved metals, but I've, uh, I did run a laser engraver at a previous job and the darker stuff like that tended to engrave a little bit easier too. So, hope that helps. Uh, Paul Sakoski asks, what are your suggestions for a sheath extension? I have a Buck 105, which I love, but the handle digs into my side. As a result, I'd like to extend the sheath lower on the hip, which will give better access to my knife as well. What do you suggest? Real easy uh, to do and not too, or not too expensive either. I've got a Buck 109 right here, or sorry, Buck 
Wait a minute. This is not a 109. This is a 105. Did you say 109 or did I say 109? You said 105. Good thing I pulled a 105 to show in the video here. Anyway. We're that good. You want to add a castrum dangler to this guy. Real simple. It's a solid riveted leather belt loop with essentially a D-ring here on the back. Uh, several different colors. You can get it in browns or blacks, different uh, hardware colors too. 23 bucks. Really nice. And you simply pop it right on. Now you've got a dangler ready to go. Keep it lower. It'll keep it below like a hip pack or a hip belt from a pack or a long winter coat. And it's going to keep it from digging into your side as well. And when you're getting in and out of vehicles or seats or anything like that, real easy to rotate. So it's not going to dig in when you're sitting down either. That's the guy right there. Castrum Dangler. All right. David McElroy asks, uh, is M390 a good fixed blade steel? Because I was under the impression it was a more brittle steel and I'm afraid of a malfunction if I were bearing down on the knife. Yeah, I mean, M390 is not, uh, on, on the spectrum of steels, is not one of the tougher steels out there. And I, I definitely wouldn't want it on something larger, like a chopper or stuff like that. I've always said the bigger a knife is, the more important toughness is in the equation. But smaller knives, nothing wrong with it. That's the thing. A fixed blade can be smaller, like this Bradford right here. Uh, one of the Guardian 3 is about 162 bucks for this in M390. Now, one of the things you can do to kind of bolster a steel that's not as tough as some other things, you can go a little bit thicker, which Bradford does a little bit without going overboard. And that's going to make the overall knife a bit tougher. But yeah, all depends on what you need. If it's just a small everyday carry cutting piece that you're not going to be batoning or chopping with, M390 is going to be perfectly fine. But if you need a heavier duty knife, I would tend to go for something a little more tough. You can also get stuff like 3V from Bradford which would be a really good choice. All right. Now, last but not least, closing out the video with our most serious question of the day. What knife would Santa carry on his sleigh? Dustin E. asks this question. Uh, I figure he encounters many situations where a good EDC blade would come in handy, asking for a very jolly friend. I've got it right here. It would be the Kellum Sammy small Reindeer knife. You've got reindeer antler on this guy. 30 bucks for this guy with a carbon steel straight backed blade. That'll do. That'll do. You got some knife. I mean, these, these are actually really cool. They feel comfortable. Each one's obviously a little bit different since you're dealing with a natural material. The sheath has some reindeer engraving or engraving. <laughs> reindeer graphics or tooling there on the front. Um, and this is made in Finland. And did you know that according to Finland, Santa is from Finland? I bet you he races cars too. Fin the Finns are good drivers. But this is a, I mean, this is a very Finnish profile. This straight backed spine with this style of grind is commonly called a puko or, or is called a puko. Although the, not all straight backed spine blades are pukos, weeds, blade shapes from earlier before. But yeah, check it out. Santa's from Finland, so you'd carry a Finnish knife and there's plenty of reindeer shed uh, laying around. Especially in November when all the males shed their antlers. So all of Santa's reindeer are female because we always see them with antlers on when he's moving around. So I've yet to see them at all. You got to believe harder, my friend. Well, I just fall asleep. <laughs> Me too. Anyway, that's all the time we've got for today. Thanks everyone for your questions, man. As always, really appreciate it. Go ahead and leave your questions in the comments of this video for a chance to be featured on a future episode. If you want to get your hands on any of these knives, you can check out the links in the description to take you over to knifecenter.com and make sure you sign up for our knife rewards program so that when you buy one of these knives today, you'll at least earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center signing off. See you next time.